And so for the past couple of weeks, we've been, been in the series talking about how to pray. And I believe everyone has a different way to pray because prayer is a communication with God. And so I don't think there's any right or wrong way on how you can pray. And so today I'm going to share with you what I was taught when I first learned how to pray. And I hope you can take bits and pieces of that and then apply it to your own life. But before we begin, I wanna share this story. And so in college, that's where really my head knowledge of God started coming to my heart. And I remember sophomore year, I went on this winter retreat. And so we broke out into these small groups and the retreat was actually, I'm pretty sure it was about prayer. And so we break out in these small groups and we're closing out the group and the leader goes, who wants to pray? And so I'm looking around, I'm like, well, I know it's not gonna be me, but I'm like nosy. So I'm like, I kinda wanna see who's gonna pray. And so I'm like looking to person to person and I realized that all of them are in the same posture and like maybe I didn't get the memo. They have their hands clasped together, their eyes are closed and the head is bowed. And I go, well, how can you volunteer to pray if you're in this posture? And so I'm like looking at each person. And then it kind of dawns on me when my eyes lock with the leader that that's why they're in this posture and she's looking to me to pray. And so I did like this and I did not open my eyes until I heard the word, amen. And now we aren't gonna do like a raise of hands but I'm sure some of us can relate to that situation or the fact or the idea of praying out loud. I think as, soci as a society, we have overcomplicated this idea of prayer. We're too scared to pray out loud because we're scared that what we say is not gonna be elegant like someone next to us, or maybe we don't know what to say, or there's going to be this awkward silence. And I'm not gonna lie, I share those same thoughts and feelings with you. But because of what Jesus Christ has done for us through his life, his death, and his resurrection, we have this opportunity to speak directly to God, who is the creator of this world, and I think that is an amazing opportunity, and so I hope that our earthly fears do not get in our way of that amazing opportunity. And so today, before we start, I wanna open in prayer, and I won't ask who's gonna pray, I'll, I'll pray. So, will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you for the opportunities that you give us to just connect with you, Lord, if it's through the Bible, through your sacraments, coming to worship, or having an opportunity to have a conversation with you through prayer, Lord. Today, we just pray that your spirit, your Holy Spirit, come down and fill this room and fill us, Lord, and we ask for guidance, Lord. Please teach us how to pray, Lord. Give us the words and the wisdom so that we're able to have a conversation with you that is pleasing to you. It's in your name we pray, amen. And so as we look at our reading for today, we need to set up some context beforehand. And so for the text today, it was an excerpt that the prophet Jeremiah wrote to God's people who are in exile. And so the capital of Jerusalem has been destroyed and for over 20 years, there's been three deportations of God's people into exile. And some believe that Jeremiah has written this letter shortly after this first deportation. And so now if you go back and you look at Jeremiah 28, there's this false prophet and he claims that this exile will only last two years. And then he tells God's people, well, stay away from them, isolate yourself. It's only two years, and then you're going to be back in God's promised land. But when we read in Jeremiah, Jeremiah comes in and shares God's truth. And so that's what our reading is for today. And so if you would like to follow along in the blue Bible, there's some blue Bibles right in your pew. We're going to be on page 732 for today. And we're gonna start at verse five. So we're going to 732, verse five. Jeremiah, oh, I should tell you the chapter. Jeremiah 29, verse five. And it says, so Jeremiah is commanding these people to build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease. So let's stop there for a moment and look at this. So one prophet is telling 
God's people, that you're only gonna be here for two years. And then we have Jeremiah, and he's telling them to build houses, plant crops, harvest the crops, start families, have your children get married and produce. And when I look at that passage, it reminds me of what we see in Genesis when God is speaking to Adam and Eve, the first humans to walk the earth, right? And he's telling Adam and Eve to, to, to produce crops and then multiply. And so it sounds more like Jeremiah is saying, you're going to be here for a while. And so you better start embracing this culture and make this, this, this place a home. And Jeremiah was right, because God's people spent 70 years in captivity. And what I find most fascinating about Jeremiah's remark is actually in verse seven. And so if you go back to our Bibles, we're gonna look at verse seven here. Jeremiah 29, verse seven. He commands them, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For it is in welfare that you will find your welfare. And so God's people are being asked to pray for those that have put them into exile. They're being asked to pray for the enemies. And so to give you the equivalent of this, this would be like Christians in Iraq being asked to pray for ISIS. And so, okay, I can pray for them. And so I want you to hold your spot there on page 732, but we have to go look at Psalm 137 real quick. And that's on page 579. And here's someone praying about the Babylonians, those who have put them in exile. And so we're going to go to verse eight. And it says, O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall be he who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall be he who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. And so here the author is praying about his enemies. And he says, be doomed, be destroyed, get in return what you have done to us. And then he says, take your little children and dash them. Oh, blessed is he who takes the children and dashes them against rocks. And so this is a prayer of revenge and hate. But now we have to go back and look at Jeremiah 29, verse seven, and really carefully look at what he's saying. He says, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find yours. Which means in Babylon's success, you will find your success. And so Jeremiah is telling God's people to pray a prayer of love, of blessing and growth on these people. And I believe that is what Jeremiah is telling us today. When we pray for our enemies, we aren't going to do the Psalm 137 prayer and pray they like trip over or stub their toe or something. We are called to pray a prayer of goodness, of welfare and blessing on our enemies. And so I remember another time in college, I had this opportunity to be discipled by this sweet lady named Pei Tong. And we would like just meet in the dining hall and we would look at the Bible and figure things out together. And I remember one time I was having like this really hard time with my roommate and I just like shared it all on her, right? And I was hoping that after she would look up at me and she'd be like, yes, Anna, you're completely right. Your roommate should not be breathing that loud in the space. She's a loud breather. (laughs) But she didn't. She looks at me and she goes, have you prayed for her? And I was like, are you serious? Like, did you not just hear what I just told you? And she proceeds to say that she has done this in the past, that she prays for those that she has conflict with or who don't like her or who are her enemies. And then she says that it may not change your situation or your circumstances, but she was certain that a prayer, which is a conversation with God, will change your heart. Which leads to how I wanna spend the rest of our time for today. How can we pray for our enemies or those we are in conflict with? Just like I stated in the opening story, prayer is hard, right? And maybe it's a little bit easier to pray for those we like, but now we are commanded to pray for those we don't like. And I think that is challenging. And so I wanna break this down in a tangible way that will remind you and kind of using the acronym prayer. And so if you have that little pink sheet here, it should be right here, it says prayer. And so we're going to 
talk through this a little bit. And if you didn't get one, you can just grab one on the way out too. And so the first thing we are called to do is praise. And so as we open our time with God, our conversation with God, we are told to just praise God. And I think this is really helpful, especially when you are in conflict with someone and you're trying to pray for them. I don't know about you, but when it comes to me and I'm in conflict with somebody in my own life, that's something that I just become super fixated on and I forget about all the good things that are going on around me. It's like I have this tunnel vision. And so at first we spend our time with God praising him for the goodness in our lives. Maybe it's our family, it's our food, the opportunity to worship God. Or maybe your situation is so complicated that all you can be thankful for is that you're getting through that moment or that day or that you have this day off. In part of our praise, I just encourage you to find something to be thankful for. I know for myself, I usually try to start with five things I'm thankful for, right? And some days I come up with five things, I say, well, that's it, that's the, situa- that's the kind of day I'm having. But other days, my list can go on and on. So once we're done praising, we are called to repent. And repent is the act of turning away from areas in our own life that are separating us from God or from living a life that is pleasing to God. I think there's this popular saying, it's, it's like I take, it, take, it takes two to tango, and I also believe that is true when it comes to conflict. It takes two to argue. And so I know repentance is hard, especially for someone like me who is only mildly competitive. I like to be first, I like to win, and I like to be right. But as Christ followers, we are called to die to ourselves, our old ways, our habits, and pride, and to live in this new life with Christ. And so at the feet of the creator, you can let your walls down and search your hearts for areas in your situation where you might be seeking to be right instead of seeking for reconciliation. You're able to search areas in your heart where you're unable to forgive a person or an event that happened. But whatever your situation may be, Where can you repent of your own wrongdoing in the situation and turn to God for help? I think this act of repentance shows us our need for a savior and it pushes us closer and closer and closer to Jesus Christ because he can do what we can't do. And then we go to asking. And I think most of us, at least for myself, are pretty good at asking. That's where I spend the majority of my prayer. And it's my favorite section, it can go pretty long. But when it comes to praying for someone else who we might dislike, I wonder how that's going to change what we ask for. We know we are called to pray for their welfare, so we can't pray that they stub their toe on the way out of the door. And so I know for myself, the main point I ask for, besides wisdom, calmness, peace, and patience, is seeing that person through God's eyes because we have to remember that everybody on this earth is a child of God. And so can God give me his eyes and his heart to be able to see that person or community like the precious child that he sees them as? I think another one for me is, I may not be able to forgive this person at this time, but I know that God can forgive them through me. And so soften my heart, show me where I'm wrong so that I can forgive and have the peace that is only found in Christ. And as Jeremiah said, pray for the prosperity of that community or that person in their own life. And lastly, we yield or we listen. Prayer is a conversation and conversation takes two people actively talking but two people actively listening. I don't know how many times I like shoot up a prayer, say amen, and then I just like go on with my day. But what about listening to God and how he responds to our praises, our repentance, and our asking? At least for myself, I can sometimes say, well, well, God doesn't talk to me. He doesn't answer my prayers. But then I stop and think, am I really listening to God? Am I actively seeking him out? Because last week, Pastor Mike reminded us that God always responds in either three ways, yes, no, or wait. And I think yielding is the hardest part. Because God speaks to us, he might speak to us through a friend, a Bible, or a feeling, but we must make a conscious effort to seek him out. And we all know that that takes time, and God's time and our time are completely different, right? 
And so one thing that I've done in my own life is I have a dog and I walk her day and night. And usually when I walk my dog, I listen to a podcast, make a phone call, or I listen to music. But sometimes I intentionally decide to leave that at home. And when I walk, I don't daydream and I don't think about what I have to do. I'm intently trying to listen to God. Maybe he will give me a thought, a feeling, a word. He will speak to me through the birds or nature. I just try to have a walk with God. We can have a conversation with God through praise, repentance, asking, and yielding to God. And I know that prayer takes time and it takes practice. Just like anything else we want to become, good at it. And yeah, it might be easy to pray for ourselves, but when it comes to our enemies, I think that is even harder. But here's the good news, is that through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, once you believe, you're given the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. And as the book of Romans reminds us, the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf to God. And so before we transition into this time of meditation and offering, a time where I encourage you to try the acronym prayer out and talk to God, I just want to spend a little time inviting the Holy Spirit in to fill this room and to show us how to pray. And so will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity just to be able to come, come to you and just pray, Lord, and just be open So, Lord, I just ask that you fill this room, you fill our bodies and our hearts with the Spirit, Lord, and just guide us, Lord, and show us how to pray. And we just thank you for the gift of your Spirit, Lord, that intercedes on our behalf when we don't know what to say, Lord. And so, just, Lord, we ask that you just open our hearts and our minds to where you're guiding this conversation today. It's in your name we pray. Amen.